If you notice, so behind us, we have, a, we have all the pictures of who Father uh, Zach has talked about. And, we, and all these, uh, you know, saints or future saints. <laughs> So, anyway, we're really... Alright, so I'm going to hand the mic, the mic over to Bill. Now, this one is probably the most difficult given Father's preference for baseball. Based on your Yankees experience, can you move to the Mets? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Alright, thank you, Mr. Funny Man out there. <laughs> My whole family is actually Mets fans. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the lone Yankees fan of the bunch. Oh, hold on. Um, you know, they were, what, 112 wins or whatever in 1998. That was when I started watching. They were the only team on TV back then, so I had no choice. It was, you know, when you're a kid, you like a team that wins, right? Nobody wants to watch the Mets. Gosh. <laughs> question here that ties in with your personal life and your prayer life. How often do you pray while running? And how do you pray while running? And who's going to win the NCAA cross-country championship? I, I can definitely not answer the third part of that. Um, I get that question a lot. Um, I have personally never been the type to like pray rosaries while I run. I don't know, I can't, I've tried, I can't answer why, but it just doesn't, I, my brain just wants to completely zone out when I run. So what I end up doing, before I start, literally I'll start my watch and the first thing I'll do is I'll make the sign of the cross and I'll offer up my run that day for someone. I'll, you know, I'll, in, in essentially these words, Lord, any of the pain I experience while I run, which is usually a lot, uh, whatever pain I experience while I run today, may it be for such and such uh, an intention. And that way I just view my entire run as, as a prayer rather than feeling like I need to say prayers while I'm running, if that makes sense. Of the 11 officially canonized U.S. saints, are they distinguishable by traits not exhibited by saints from other countries? Yeah, I, I've thought about that a lot. Uh, when I was putting this talk together, I was kind of thinking, is this unfair maybe to, to like hype up these guys at maybe the expense of, of uh, saints elsewhere in the world? Um, I would say, look, we all play for the same team, right? We're all part of the universal Catholic Church. And in, to, in that sense, what we have much more in common than what we have apart. What I wanted to highlight in this talk, though, is I do feel, by looking at some of these guys, that there's something about men who were born here. Uh, now, because there's a lot of, there are other American saints who have lived elsewhere than came to serve here. A, a, a Damien of Molokai is a perfect example, often kind of seen as an American saint. Unipero Serra, same thing, American saint. But they were missionaries from elsewhere. I think there's something about being born here, uh, living in this culture, uh, that kind of instills a certain sense of duty to freedom. And that's really what I wanted to highlight in this talk, is that Americans, we believe strongly that we are blessed, right? That we have so many awesome things that we've been given and that it's our duty to share those things with other people. And I think that, I, I'm not gonna say that no other saint shares that, but I think there's something special about the American-born saints that uh, they just got that. They understood the sense of duty and, and the sense of importance that, that an obligation, I've received this thing that's so good, I need, I feel, this, I feel compelled to share it with somebody else. <coughs> You mentioned the Bill of Rights. If there were a Bill of Responsibilities, what key items do you think should be included? Uh, responsibilities in what realm? The Bill of Responsibilities. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> needed a couple hours to think about that. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll just kind of start riffing off the top of my head then. I mean, First of all, the responsibility to each other, right? Uh, kind of what I emphasized in, in, the, in this talk is that um, as tempting as it can be to live for ourselves or even just for our immediate 
kind of circle, right? I mean, some of you guys probably remember there was that book a couple of years ago that was real big. It was called The Benedict Option, I think, by, oh, what was the name of it? What was it? Okay. Yeah. So it, the book was basically talking about, like, is it time as Catholics to kind of take this more monastic retreat from the culture and say, like, oh, we, this is, it's a lost cause. Like, basically, like, it's toxic out there. We need to, to go within ourselves and focus on ourselves. And I find that to be very tempting. I even think that there's, in some senses, a moral case for why it can be appropriate at certain times. But I, the fear is that it erases a sense of duty we all have to each other, right? And I don't just mean this kind of like, oh, we're, we all have to do charity and, you know, go and, and, and participate in all these service outreaches through our churches. I'm more talking about just the simple things, the things of like, my, uh, you know, my elderly neighbor is sick. I should go check on him, that kind of thing. Or my, uh, my nephew is going through a depression and I notice he, he doesn't, he stopped going to church. Maybe I should see like, hey, do you want to start coming to mass with me? That kind of thing. I think that that's number one in, in because almost every responsibility almost stems from that one thing, right? If, if, we, if we belong to each other, there are so many responsibilities that, that kind of just branch out of that sense of commitment to each other. Um, in, in addition to that, I mean, I would say absolutely pray. I, I don't know what man is worth his salt if he doesn't pray. Um, especially, and I, I will add to this, something I've been re reflecting on a lot recently for whatever reason. Uh, I think that we as Catholic men have such a, an obligation to be, uh, to have an interior life, to be self-reflective, to be people who can recognize our flaws, right? I'm, I'm finding more and more that that's one of the biggest issues with our, our country, is that people, maybe this is unfair to cast this broad of a net, but people a lot of times to me feel, seem very unaware of their own flaws, the ways that they go around hurting people, uh, and want to cast the problems of the world on everybody else. So I find that the more that we're introspective, can do an examination of conscience, can line up and go to confession, the better that the church and the world will be. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've said this at Good Shepherd so many times. People, somebody asked me right when I first started at Good Shepherd, what will be the a sign to you that this is a healthy parish? And I said, well, that's easy. It's the lines of the confessional. I don't really, the lines for communion, that's great, but I wanna see the lines of the confessional. That means a healthy, reflective, introspective, prayerful church. That's not, as we've seen with a lot of the people who receive communion, um, receiving communion, communion is not a mark of holiness, right? Um, it should be, or at least should be a mark of, 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 of desiring holiness and working towards it despite our sinfulness. But uh, lines of the confession, that's a mark that you're taking your, your spiritual life seriously. So I would say those are the responsibilities, prayer, reflection, and commitment to each other. Should we try to imitate saints or simply be inspired by the saints or both? Um, yeah, I, I guess a little bit of both. There's a story I really like. Um, there was a follower of St. Francis in the early, it, when St. Francis was alive, there was a, another brother who said, <laughs> he basically said, I like what that guy's doing. I'm gonna mimic him 100%. So he basically just shadowed St. Francis. If St. Francis took a bite of food, this guy took a bite of food. If St. Francis knelt down to pray, this guy would kneel down to pray. And something's lost there, obviously. You know, like, he was kind of walking the walk, I guess. But, like, what's going on interiorly? So the way I, I mean, this is kind of cliche to say, but, like, God didn't call any of you to be any of the guys I talked about today, he called you to be who you are, right? Each one of you is made to be saint, whatever your name is, right? Um, so that, I think that we have to be careful not to trend too far in either direction. You don't want to just become copycats of someone. That's one thing I love that uh, Blessed Carlo Acutis, you know, who's, who's kind of uh, that, that, that young saint that was beatified, the Italian boy, you know, what does he say? We, we're not meant to be photocopies. We're meant to be originals. And I love that. So don't, don't get caught in this copycat mentality. Um, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, but at the same time, you can't just feel like, oh, I'm just going to waltz through life and God will just magically make me a saint. Like, no, God is giving you people around you to be inspirations to you. And you should pick things that you see in other people that are good, admirable, noble things and imitate those things, not necessarily just a person as a whole. Do you find that more men will go to Catholic Mass and participate in practice in their faith at their parish when they witness a more manly type of priest? Um, yeah, 100%. Um, I think we have done, I don't want to say irreparable, but enormous damage to the church in America by taking the masculinity out of our faith. Um, this is something Father Don Calway really stressed that last year, I remember. Um, you know, one of, I, if you guys are, those of you from Good Shepherd, some of these things I say, I'm just repeating myself over and over, but I'm, I love um, the, the Canadian psychologist, Jordan Peterson, um, one of my favorite kind of intellectual uh, figures right now. Not, not Catholic, but just not wise. Yet. What's that? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Amen. That's, that's, a, that's a right mentality. <laughs> He said in a recent uh, po uh, podcast or, or interview or whatever, he said, every Catholic church should have a banner outside that says, men welcome here. And I thought, like, dang, that's so true. I mean, we live in this world where, where men are just villainized for being who we are, right? For just being men. And uh, we're losing men in the church because of that. And like, what a, what a great thing to invite men in and say like, this is a place for you. This is a place for you to exercise all of the good that you are and, and to bring good to the world and to, and to see your place in the grand scheme of things, your, your place in the sight of God, um, that we need to bring that back. And it doesn't mean that we need to, you know, sometimes I think the danger is you, you, we try to like act really super manly, right? It doesn't mean that you have to act in a certain way. You know, uh, being a masculine man doesn't have to have like a, a, a specific paradigm. I think the guys that I just talked about, all three of them look so, so different, you know? Solanus Casey, uh, a, a slight breeze would have blown the guy over, you know? Nobody was mistaking him for some kind of, you know, big, strong, tough guy. He was, if you ever hear a recording of his voice, he was so light-spoken, he had a disease when he was young, so he has this wispy, high-pitched voice. No one's walking into a church and saying like, oh, there's a man's man, you know? <laughs> but like, listen to what the guy talked about and what he did and how he acted and how he sacrificed himself, and it's like, okay, he was. He absolutely was a very masculine man. So, uh, short answer, yes, absolutely important. I appreciate all the questions we received, but we only have time for two more to keep up with our schedule. So for those of you whose questions we didn't get to, we appreciate them, and we'll get those to Father, and then we'll you know, determine a way to get that back to you all post-conference. Uh, this uh, next to last question, any advice in this up-and-coming election as we vote as Catholic Americans? Yeah, I always get myself in trouble with these. <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, so as a priest, I can't, I can't tell someone who to vote for, right? But I can tell you what's important. Um, the things that are important, well, all the things that our Catholic Church teaches, right? So you should never, ever walk into the voting booth and feel like you're compromising what our church teaches. Now, there are times, and this is, this is something I find that we've gotten ourselves in trouble with recently. There are times when you do have to pick the lesser of two evils, right? Not every person who is running for office is perfect, you know? Would, would it be, would, you know, would that it was just Jesus, the second coming, running for every political office? It's not the case. So we have flawed human beings running for office. They're not always going to uh, be the, the, the perfect list of Catholic social, uh, you know, uh, a teaching, right? So sometimes you have to you have to say, well, this guy may not be the best, but he doesn't do this. And I would say, here's the things that I would say: absolutely, we cannot be endorsing anyone who who is promoting abortion. Absolutely not, right? I don't I don't know how we can I don't know how to justify that. I really don't. Um, uh, 
anybody who would be promoting, I, I, I'm actually now recalling a homily I preached at Good Shepherd where I went through a, a USCCB document about Catholic conscience for voting. And that was the first thing, it was pro-life. The next thing was uh, ra racism, actually. So any, if you believe a politician supports something that is outwardly racist or out, outwardly prejudiced against a group of people, that would pr really pr prohibit us from being able to vote for such a person in good conscience. The third thing, I don't think it was part of the document, and, and God bless us, I don't think anybody would have thought it needed to be part of the document, but I'll add it. We, I don't think, and I, I'm fairly certain this would be the stance of the church, that we can support anybody who endorses this new radical gender ideology. Um, I, I think that this is... There's a, there's a real threat to this, a real threat to how it's kind of tearing at the seams of, of objective reality uh, and how it really, uh, we see it can begin to really infringe upon the rights of so many people. I, th I think that people who endorse some of this stuff, I, I think the majority of them come from a place of, they think they're being compassionate and kind, uh, but they're not realizing the damage that they're doing to people. So uh, that's kind of my two cents on that. We'll wrap up with a question related to the saints. Is it necessary for a future saint to have been either a martyr, someone who has been killed for his or her Christian beliefs, or a confessor, someone who was tortured or persecuted for his or her faith, but not killed? And the follow-up is, is it true that a martyr does not require any miracles? I thought to be a saint, you have to have two confirmed uh, that's a good question, actually. I don't know the answer to that, uh, whether a martyr necessarily needs miracles. You, that might be correct, actually. I mean, because there are a handful of, you, I mean, you guys know this, when we have like daily mass and we'll celebrate like so-and-so and companions, the thing they don't tell you is that the companions, it's not like two other buddies, it's like a hundred other people who were persecuted at the same time. So like, I doubt that all 100 of those people had like two, uh, miracles associated. So I, I, my, I, my thought is that, that that is the case, that if they're a verified martyr, as in like died explicitly for their faith, then yeah, I think that it's kind of an auto-canonization. This is why so many, so, uh, so many uh, guys in the early church, it was like what they wanted to do. They're like, I'm going to be a martyr. Like St. Francis of Assisi, we tell the story about like when he went to go see the Sultan as if it was this great act of ecumenism, right? This very nice fluffy thing. He went there hoping the Sultan would cut his head off. Like that is entirely what he, his mission was. He didn't want to convert the Sultan. He wanted to really, I don't want to say instigate him, but he wanted to say, you're wrong. Your soul is in danger. This is who Jesus is. And now do with me what you will. And the Sultan was so, I don't know, inspired by that, his brashness, his boldness, that he let him live, and, and apparently the two, you know, became somewhat of friends. So, um, martyrdom was very much sought after in the, in the early church for that. I don't, I don't endorse that behavior. <laughs> I don't think it's particularly wise today. I think that, um, you know, it's kind of St. Paul's mentality, right? If, if, I, if I live, I live for the Lord. If I die, I die for the Lord. And I think that we shouldn't be rushing to do one or the other, but just to be used as the Lord wants us to be used. Did I answer the, uh, There was a few parts of that. I believe you did. Okay. So we're going to transition back over to Kyle. So let's give thanks for the further introduction.